I don't care what I'm going through. Yes. That when I hear that song, man, it's two songs that I guess barely say I done played the heck out of that one. And God is, oh man, I play, I got, oh, oh it's so funny. I, I was listening to this and I thought about it. On my computer, I got God is like eight times. And by that time, I'm, I'm warmed up. <laughs> And then I fall over four times it is. <laughs> now I'm ready to pray. Praise <laughs> God. Man, you know God is so good. He is so good. Yeah. Belly showed me I got a timer on my phone, so she says you can time yourself so you know how much time you got left. And I think that was a hint. Pastor, you've been going too long sometimes. <laughs> okay, sometimes, it is. sometimes it is, but with me, that I can preach. Oh, see, look, see, this is what a lot of people understand. When I started out preaching, I had to preach an hour and a half, you know, close to two hours because in the, in the prisons, the men were there for that time, you know, in the jails. Yes. So I had to go up. We didn't have a lot of praise and worship. We had, I had to go up and, man, I, and it just rubbed off. And they, they, I guess, all right, Lord, I heard that. He said, y'all live in prison. <laughs> okay. okay. You got to pay your news, Oh, man, you God is good. Praise God. You know. Um, I will be sending out an update, you know, some things that we're doing um, this year, the end of this year and into next year um, of, of our upcoming events for just, you know, for December and also January. I do have a calendar for you that I got to give you before you leave so that we can talk on the phone. I got some of the things on there, but I need to, we need to come together on when we're going to do some other things. Um, Man, look at your neighbor again and say, God is good. God uh, is good. Y'all don't, don't even sound like you believe that. Look at that. Tell him how to say it. God is good. That's God right. Good. Come on and tell him how to say it. God is good. Come on, say it. That's right. He is good. I don't understand what good is. Uh, you, feel you know, see, you, you, you appreciate that when you've been through something in life. Okay? And you may even be going through something, but you can think on, God is good. You know, he's faithful. See, that alone right there, it, it makes us where we can continue on for another minute, another day. You know, and, and I, just, I just want you to remember that. God is good. Well, we're finishing up on love. And it was so amazing that I've been talking on love, I think, four or five weeks now. And I had a chance to talk to Pastor Minor that comes in in the evening. We hadn't even spoken till, you know, in about two months, you know, till last night, yesterday morning, rather. And we were talking, he says, you know, when I told him, I said, I've been ministering on, you know, love. He said, do you know that God has had me on there about the same time in our church? See, and, and we both laughed. We were like, well, I said, what? He said, yeah, I think this is like my fifth or sixth week also. He says, He's been moving our ministry in regards to love, you know, and they come in at six on Saturdays and then they come in uh, six on Sundays here. Um, and it was just a blessing to see how God is moving. Two separate ministries, never talked to each other on the same thing. See, and as I share with you, love never fails, okay? And how many of you uh, remember what the title of last week was? See if you was paying attention. Don't look at your notes, but it should be in your heart. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It also means that some of y'all didn't open up your email. <laughs> no, love can turn things around. Okay. This is the final part of it. Love can turn things around. Last week we were able to look into the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we seen that even through the midst of the burning fiery furnace, how they maintained their relationship with God. And because of that, God stepped into the midst of a heated event in their life. We were also able to look at, you know, how love is a force. Just like we say faith is a force, love is a force. The Bible says love never fails. Also, the Bible teaches us that when everything else is over, there was only three things that remain. Faith, hope, and love. So that's how important love is. You know, but... A lot of times we, we, we try to live in the love that we know, which is human love, which that love will always be conditional. 
It will always be conditional. It's mean I love you as long as you take out your trash. I love you as long as you buy me a car. I love you as long, you see, and, and see when the things that you want are not met, then you have a challenge with whether you're still walking in love or not, you see? And that's kind of like, you know, we, we, we give God that same type of love, really. You know, Lord, I need my bills paid. And we love while we're waiting on it. But when it don't come, well, I don't know if he loved me. And then, you know, you don't want to say, you don't want to really say, you don't want to really say, you don't know if you love him. You want to say, I don't know if he loved me. But, you know, we be in that, we be in that moment of question. You see what I'm saying? We be in that moment of question. And you know what? These things are all right if we admit them. God will work you through them. If you come to him and say, Lord, I'm having a hard time loving you right now, he's going to work you through that. He knows you. He knows you already, so he knows what you are. He says, if you ask him, he will do it. That's what the Bible says, okay? But we, we feel that it's less than holy. You know, I also know I'm saying like supposed to say, less than holy. To say that we're having challenges with the way we feel about God. <laughs> Turn your Bibles to Romans 8, 28. By this time, you should know that one by heart, but just in case you don't. because we're going to read that all together. Everyone have a Bible? 828. Yes, Romans 828. I want to make sure everyone has a Bible. All right, and if not, do, do the thing on your cell phone. <laughs> I just started using the one that reads to you on the cell phone the other day. I love that one. Oh, man, I was sitting up there, and, and it strolls down, right? And my eyes was doing like this. And I kind of got hypnotized to the phone. I said, oh, hey. <laughs> I said, let me stop the rolling and just listen to it. Uh, I was like, okay, praise God. All right. Romans 8, 28 reads. And we're going to read this together no matter what version you have. Just go ahead and jump in. Let's go. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Stop. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We went over this pretty good, pretty good in detail last week. But we're going to stay right here on this because I want you to understand this scripture. You know, as we know there's many things that come into our life that are hard times, hard, difficult, you know, many things, okay? I want you to understand that this scripture does not say that everything that comes into your life was sent by God, okay? There are things that will come into your life, things that will happen in your life that is not of God. I gave you an illustration. You take a, a, a mother that has a child. Child is six years old outside playing, minding its own business, and, 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 and it gets hit by a car. God didn't send that into that child's life, okay? He didn't send that into the mother's life. You have a person that's diagnosed with cancer, okay? God didn't send that into that person's life, all right? This is what I want you to understand because, see, if you think that God sent that into your life, then you will not resist that. You will, you will yield to that and accept that. That is not what God wants you to do. You get fired from a job. You lose a job, you lose a home, foreclosure, you go through a divorce. You know, these are things that God did not send these things into your life. There are some things that, that, that are devil-induced. There are some things that are self-induced. We know that. You have to decide whether they were devil-induced or self-induced. But we're so quick to say that the devil is responsible for everything, which is not true. Some of that we should take responsibility for. See, we should take responsibility for all right? I mean, you got your car repossessed. You understand me? It could have been because the note was $1,000 a month. You knew you only made 2000 a month, and you got another 1500 in rent. Mm -hmm. 
That wasn't God's fault. That wasn't the devil had to do that. That was your bad judgment. Okay? We have to start seeing things the way that they are. You see, we talk a lot about prosperity. And God definitely wants you to be prosperous. Yes, he does. But you have to also understand, if God gave some of us a million dollars right now, we would probably be broke in four or five years. Why? Because we haven't matured enough to use that money. See, you have to understand that, yes, you, 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 you are entitled to what God wants to give you, but the thing of it is, you are not mature enough to handle it right now. Yes, you're going to give your child a, a, a car when they get, you know, a, a, when they get 16 or 17, okay? But you're not going to do it when they're 10. I use myself as an example. My parents bought me a car when I was in high school. I was 16 because in that day, they go to show you how old you were. You get your license at 16, all right? I mean your real license, not to permit. You be driving for real at 16, okay? And I thought I was mature enough for that car, but my mom and dad knew better. And they told me, don't take that car out of that backyard. Because they wanted to get some insurance, some other things. They said, don't take it out. They knew, all right? Man, I kept looking at that car in that backyard, and I had, you know, you know how a kid is. It sat back there. I fixed it up, and I was back in the days of real low riding, okay? I fixed it up, and I had it up now, and it was looking good. It was lifted, you know? And I was looking, and I was like, man, and my friend, he's got to come out by the house. I didn't take him in the backyard and show him the car. I can't, you know, I, I wanted to put him in front of the house. So one day, I said, man, I'm finna go to this party. Mom was gone. Dad was gone. Man, I jumped in that car, bad guy, and was going to pick up my friend and met my mom coming down the opposite way. And she looked, and I looked at her. We passed each other looking like this. I said, oh, Lord. And see, I grew up in a time that they would whip your butt. I don't care how old you were. I grew up in a time that you knew what you had coming. So I floated it. I looked at the rear view mirror. Mom, she whipped the turn, a U-turn, and it was on. The chase was on. I dissed my mom. Okay, I dissed her. Went on, picked up my friends. Four or five hours later, I was in a serious accident. Car turned over, a couple of people throwing out the back window. Okay? And the bad part, that was bad, but it gets worse than that. I was racing somebody, and the police were sitting at the red light, seeing us coming down the street. Couldn't even lie. Why am I telling you this? It's because even though something was available to me, did not mean I had the maturity to handle it. I needed to respect the judgment of the more mature person, and in our case, God, to wait. Even though you could see it, even though you could just touch it, but it may not be the time for you to operate it. So, Looking back at our scripture, as I said, it's truly hard for us to see when we're in the midst of a situation or a hard place, okay? And why is that? Because, man, when you're in the middle of something, man, it's hard to see. It's hard to see out. You know, it's hard. I mean, you know, the only thing you see is bills. The only thing you see is doctor reports. The only thing you see is, you know, it's hard at that moment. But you have to remember, like I shared with you, Fog. Fog will lift. But you notice when you're driving, very seldom do we stop. We continue on in the fog. We put on our high beams, our fog lights. Okay? And God reminded me, you know, um, of my construction background. We did some schools in Arrowhead. And we did it during the time of the year when it snowed. And that fall was so bad, it took us, we, we used to leave school at 10, uh, about 10, 10.30 at night. And it took us from 10.30 to 1.30 to come to the bottom of that mountain. That's how foggy it was. That's how foggy it was. So what I did, I said, I went over here to the, to the auto body shop. Not the auto body, but the auto parts. And I said, man, I need some fog lights. I bought a gang of fog lights for the truck. I mean, well, look, if you were standing at the bottom of my mountain, you thought it was a UFO. I lit it up, but it only gave me a little bit more vision. 
And God was so good that one time I was letting the guy that I was with drive the vehicle, and I hope the window rolled down because he couldn't, we couldn't see anything. And I had my head out trying to look, you know, and I had been like that for a few minutes. And when I turned, we were about that far from the mountain right there. Why am I telling you this? There are times you're going to be like that. You're going to have to trust God to guide you. There are going to be times that you can't see. Why? It's because a lot of times we live in the moment. You're living in the moment. God is living already in the future. So what you can't see, he can see. So at those times and moments, don't, don't, don't feel like you're, you're less spiritual. Don't feel like something has happened to your faith. We all go through that. Okay? One of the parts we talked about last week was we know. The first part of that scripture where it says, and we know. We agreed that Paul was talking to, first of all, born-again believers, the church. He was talking also to people that were willing to trust God, people that were willing to obey God, those who were able to walk by faith in love. Catch this, what I said. Faith in love, having faith in love. Having your faith in love. In love means that you're literally having faith in God. What you're saying is, is that, Lord, you said love never fails. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have faith in your love. No matter what this person does, no matter what this person says, I'm going to operate in love. Yes, it's hard. That's why I said having faith in love. Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's hard. When you're hurt and disappointed by someone, yes, it is extremely hard to love that person. You know, you got a bad boss at the job. Just lean. Every time you see it, they ain't never got nothing good to say. Yes, it's hard to love that person. Those, you're going to find that there's going to be times that you're going to have to go into the bathroom, sit on the toilet, and lock the door, and say, Lord, help me. Help me to love or either give me the rest of the day off. You're going to find yourself in those times. So don't be, don't be shocked when you do. One thing I mentioned we didn't find in this scripture was this. It never says that it was going to be easy. Paul never said that. He didn't say it was going to be easy. He never said it was not going to be painful. See, we don't want no pain. See, even now, I go in and they get ready to give me a shot. Man, I understand what I've been through in my life. When I see that lady, you know how we, all right, I, I, you know, I'm just going to talk to the men right now. You know how we do. We don't, we, we don't want to whip out. But boy, we got our hands so tight that, 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 that when, we, when we let them go, you can see they all white because the blood is gone. You know, and then they come up to you and you know how you, you glance while they're coming. But when they get ready to do it, you tense up and you turn your head. And you're like, oh man, better on the first time. You, this is when you're praying for real, not <laughs> let it get it on the first time. See, there are things that are going to happen in life that are going to be painful. That's what this scripture did not say that it was not going to be painful. But it said, whatever it is, it's going to work for your good. It didn't say that you were going to enjoy it, it didn't say that. It didn't say you're going to sit there, you understand me? You know, I don't know why Christians think that when we're going through something, we're supposed to just be dancing through it like, you know, man, please. There are times that in my life I don't feel like praising God. What am I? Am I telling the truth for me, God? I am sitting there. I am sitting there and, and like a kid. I'm like this. <clears throat> Mom, you already know what's going on, Lord. Let everything that have breath praise you, Lord. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I said, praise God. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Praise God. Mm -hmm. And I have to really make myself praise God. Mm -hmm. I really do. And he knows this. But I'm trusting that through this praise, I'm going to get a breakthrough. See, he never said you were going to enjoy it. So stop thinking that every day your life is going to be without pain, without disappointment. Without challenge. You know where we get this from? When people taught us that we were going to win, 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 win. But they didn't tell us we had to fight, 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 fight. Mm -hmm. 
When people told us we were more than a conqueror, more than a conqueror, but they forgot to tell us you're going to have to have a battle to become a conqueror. So we accepted this, but then when the battles came, oh yeah, we were like, I don't know if I'm more than a conqueror. Uh, you know, you come on now, let's be, you know, come on. There are times we quote that more than a conqueror, then there's other times we quote it more than a conqueror. <laughs> you know, there are times like that. There are times that we're driving, talking to ourselves, and please thank God for Bluetooth. Because <laughs> we talking to ourselves and we talking to God. Lord, I don't know how long this is. You have to be in this. You know that we won't mercy. But Lord, give me the strength. And you really won't. Lord, get me out. Give me the strength. You know, this is a reality. It is in those places that your character is developed. Understand this. God gave you the anointing, yes. But your character has to be developed. It's your character. It's your character, learning to be dependable, learning to be faithful, learning to understand to trust God, learning. See, this is a learning process because even G.E. says about Jesus, he had to learn to be obedient to death. Hmm. He had to learn that. It didn't come. Yeah. All the years he was growing up, he knew what he had to go through. Don't you think you, you, you seen it when he went to the garden? Lord God, if there's any other way, let's do it now. See, there's going to be times that you're going to face that. So get ready for it. But you still win. The scripture says, we know. Who are the we? You and me, the believers, those that trust in God, those that obey God. Those are the we. We know that all things, not some, all things work to the good for them that are called according to his purposes and intents. Okay. We're going somewhere. I'm just, you know, trying to remind you what we talked about. We looked at Psalms 91, 14. Turn over there in your Bible to that. Because see, everybody likes to quote Psalms 91. Oh, read Psalms 91. You need to read it yourself. <laughs> you don't tell somebody to read something, you understand? That's like giving somebody something you haven't tasted. See, that's the problem. We want to give people things that we haven't even tried in our own life. See, I don't know too many people that cook that don't taste the food before they give it to someone else. Even the king had a cup bearer. That's what he did. He tasted stuff before the king got it. Why? To make sure that it was right. Now, look what it says in 91.14. Because he has set his love on me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. We seen how this scripture was in effect in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's life last week. One thing I didn't touch on is at the end of it, the king got saved. Nebuchadnezzar says, shoot, if anybody mentioned any other God other than the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm going to cut you to pieces. See, the people around there witnessed the power of God. And those men, because of their faith, it went on to say that the king promoted them. So we find in the scripture seven things that were happening. Where it says, first it says, because he has set his love upon me. I told you that in the Greek you should read it like this. I have taken into account. God says, I have taken into account. He's taken into account, and then it says, therefore, all yours may say for this reason. All right? He's saying, I've taken into account, and for this reason, for what reason? Be of what the reason I've taken into account, because he has set his love on me. For that reason, I will do seven things in his life. I will deliver him. I will set him on high. That's promotion. I will answer him. That's God being attentive to your voice. He says, I will be with him in trouble. That means he's going to be with you in the mess, whether it's devil-induced or self-induced. He's going to be with you. Okay? He's going to be with you in the problems. He's going to be with you in the difficulties. He's going to be with you in danger. And then he goes on to say, I will honor him. And that, I told you last week, that really caught me. God going to honor 
a person that sets his love on him. And I had to research that word, and that word really means that he will give him admiration. He will give him admiration. And he will make that individual distinctive. How is he going to make it? Because people can look at you and see the blessings all over you. I mean, you know, I mean, stop and think. Sometimes you go in a place and won't nobody be in that store. And you'll come in there and about five, ten minutes later, people are coming from everywhere. That's the blessings of God on you. You look around and you think you're finna run to the counter. You look, where are these folks coming from? Exactly. I just started telling the owner. I said, you seen I was the first one here, so you ought to try to give me a discount or something, because if I wasn't here, this wouldn't be happening. <laughs> You know, and I'm serious because that's why Egypt was blessed. The only reason, because why? Joseph was in Egypt. That was the only reason it was blessed. Because of the blessings that was on Joseph, God also blessed Egypt because he was in Joseph. And he was in Egypt. Number six says, I will satisfy him. That means that God is going to fill you and make you happy. But not only make you happy, keep you happy. See, it's one thing to be happy. It's another to be kept happy. How that man say, happy, happy, happy. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I will show him my salvation. That's God's power. All right? He will demonstrate that, confirm that, and prove that through your life. That's what he's saying in that scripture. See, and we want to look at that. But like I said, last week we looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This week we want to look at the life of David. Excuse me, I'm sorry, the life of Joseph. Okay? <laughs> The meaning of Joseph's name is God adds. That's what Joseph means in Hebrew. God adds. A-D-D-S. He adds. Okay? He was the 11th son of Jacob and the, eldest, and the elder of two sons to Rachel. Rachel only had two sons. One was, come on. You know it was Joseph. One was Joseph. You got the right answer there. The other one was Benjamin. Okay? <laughs> All right. All right. And I want you to look, because we, we're going to look at five phases of Joseph's life really quick, all right? And those five phases are, one, Joseph the beloved, two, Joseph at Potiphar's house, three, uh, Joseph in prison, and then Joseph the governor, our chief minister, all right? And then number five, Joseph the forgiver, okay? Joseph the beloved, okay? This boy was 17 years old, and he was a shepherd, okay? He did not, he did not, and you can find this in, in Genesis 37, 1 through 4. I'll give it to you. You can read it on your own time. We're not going to read it today for time's sake. He did, not, he did not participate in his brother's misconduct. And that means in the stuff his brothers was doing, he didn't, he didn't have a part in it. But he came back, and he brought a report to his dad about what they were doing, okay? This is one of the reasons that the brothers didn't like him. Because the dad, you know, knew everything they was doing wrong. Joseph brought that information back. He didn't partake of it. What is that saying to us? We can't partake of things that we know that's wrong. Okay? When you know that someone is outside of the will of God or saying some things that are outside of the will, you can't get involved in that if you intend to be blessed. We're talking about the blessings of God being upon our life. You cannot be blessed like that. Okay? So he knew that. He also, he also had where his brothers hated him, okay? Hated him. Why did they hate him? Because his dad picked him out. He said, oh, that's my boy. He said, I'm finna make him a special coat of colors. He made him a special, beautiful coat of many colors. And what's so amazing about that word colors, in the New Testament, there is a scripture that says God's manifold grace. Well, that word manifold and that word colors are the same. What God was saying there is the same way Joseph had different colors, you got different graces from God. Hmm. See, that's whole for the whole teaching. But see, we go on and we see that, that, that these brothers plan to kill him. But one brother, he didn't want to kill him. He said, man, let's just put him in a hole. You know, he, you know, you know, you know how somebody is. But well, let's not talk about him too bad. Let's just talk about him just a little bit. <laughs> he, he didn't want to kill him. Reuben didn't want to kill him, so he said, let's just throw him in a hole. And then 
there was a caravan passing by, and they said, well, shoot, ain't no need of him just dying in a hole. Man, we can make a few dollars off of this, this idiot. So let's sell him. In a moment's time, he went from the beloved to a slave. You have to understand that when they sold him into slavery, he was a bona fide slave. This boy, that the only thing that made them so upset with him was a dream that God had given him. That's all. All he did, he might have told them, yes, you know, we don't know because the Bible doesn't say one way or another. He might have told them, you know, about the dream a little bit too maturely, you know, and they wasn't ready for it. You know, that's what a lot of you do. God gave you a vision, and then you went to somebody with a five by seven head, and you try to put an eight by ten picture in that five by seven head, and they go, uh, you know, come on. You have to understand it, bless you. You have to understand that God, God has given you a vision that's always going to be bigger than what you can do on your own. Why? Because if you're able to do it with your own finances, in your own life, then you get big headed and say, look what I did. Look what I did, look what I accomplished. You hear that, you hear that, you hear that through a lot of people even in ministry. My ministry. Ma, 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 It doesn't belong to you. See, if you truly believe that you're a steward of what God has given you, then that means you're only a caretaker. So it's never yours. You're just in control of it, and you're going to be held accountable for how you handle it regardless. See, because see, when we leave here, see, we are people that, that will live eternally. We're going to live eternally. Whether you live in hell or whether you live in heaven, you're going to live somewhere eternally. That's the truth of the matter. Okay? So what you want to do, if God has given you something, what you want to do, you want to be able, you want to be able to handle that with due diligence, with care. Do you think that somebody will come into your life that you're able to share with just arbitrarily? Just, just, just having to run into you? No, God trusted you enough with his word to share with that individual. That's why it's so amazing when I see people, you know, they'll see somebody on the street that's hungry, and they'll bring them to the church for the church to feed them. Why didn't you feed them? <laughs> Talk about, I don't want to miss my blessing. You took this person from wherever they was at, drove them for half an hour hungry to the church for the church to feed. No. That was a blessing that you passed up. You were supposed to feed that individual. Take and buy that individual. Well, Pastor, you don't know. So many people ask me for money. I ain't saying you get everybody now. Don't you know there's wisdom. There's wisdom. There really is. You walking down the street and somebody asking you, you understand me, for a dollar, and they stand in front of the liquor store. Hello? There is wisdom. Now, there's a difference between a person asking you for a dollar, standing in front of a hamburger stand, that person, he right there in front of the liquor store. He's like, oh, well. I, and you know what? I had a person do that once. Said they was home. I said, okay. They asked me for some money. I said, you hungry? He said, yeah. I said, all right, I'll be right back. And I went in because I was going to Jack and Box. I bought this individual a little, you know, combo. Not a happy meal. All right? A combo. I came out and gave him, you know, he cursed me out. I mean, went straight off on me. But he didn't release that bag. But he didn't get the soda. Pastor, they don't want me the soda. I said, shit, you think you're going to talk about me and get the whole deal? No. <laughs> but see, his intentions weren't for that. You have to know. So don't let the devil make you feel guilty. See, you can't just throw your money on concrete and expect a harvest. You can't do that. You can't just go and say that everything you see on TV, you understand me? They say they got some, some red oil, and if you send in $99 for the red oil, you're going to get blessed, okay? And then you, 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 and the Bible don't teach you that. The Bible doesn't teach you, I'm, I'm just being real with you. The Bible doesn't teach you because I'm coming from Psalms 91.14, sending $91.14 and get blessed. The Bible doesn't teach that. Because let me show you something. What about the person that got $82.15? They only get $82.15 worth of blessing? No. No. 
See, you've never seen that type of operation in Scripture. Why? It's because, yes, some people will not have it, but they have a desire to do it. Okay? So, just like the woman that had the two mites. See, check it out. Jesus watch it, watch what people give. The woman had the two mites, the other one had ten thousand dollars, might well say. So this one had fifty cents. And he was sitting there watching. But he said the woman gave out of her necessity. You see what I'm saying? It wasn't the amount that she gave. It was she gave out of her necessity. So don't let the devil, you know, bamboozle you and you just and then when it comes time to pay your rent. You done gave all of your money away, and you want God to give you a harvest, but you have, you have sown it in hard ground, and you wonder why you ain't got a harvest. Did nobody tell you to send you know, no, 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 no money over there to Joe, Joe Refrigerator, Prophet Joe Refrigerator, you understand with that foolishness? See, you have, we have to start being men and women of wisdom in the body of Christ. We have to, see, a lot of pastors are not going to teach you this is because it will hinder what they feel comes into the ministry. But if they truly believe that God takes care of the ministry, let me tell you something. I, my, my faith is like this. When it comes to operating in the ministry, God can send what we need through the mouth of a door and pitcher. I'm going to open the door and I see it in his mouth, I'm going to say, thank you, thank you. Just let go. Let go, because we mean them both might be rising on the ground. He don't let go. See. What am I saying to you? Stop hindering the way God wants to bless you. It may be in your health and not in finances. It may be in a contract and not in finances. It may be in your children and not in your life. You have to start recognizing how God wants to move in your life. Like I said, we're still talking about love. We'll turn things around. Let me get back on. Okay. All right, we're at the life of Joseph. Because, you know, I got a timer on here. <laughs> All right. So, again, I say to you, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who call according to his purpose. Not all things that happen in your life is sent are intended for good. Not all things sent into your life are sent by God. Not all people that are sent into your life are sent by God. You have to know this. You know, Bible says that the devil can form himself as, a, as an angel of light. Didn't say he was, he could make himself look like it. Because everybody running around and talking about hallelujah, praise the Lord. The Bible says test and try every spirit. Test and try every spirit. You have to understand this. You know, because see, Paul learned that there were people that stayed with him, but then when the time got hard, there were people that disappeared. And he had some harsh things to say about those individuals. See, he really did. Why? It's because it's not in the good times that you, you, you know, that, 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 that it's so hard for you to perform. No, it's in the hard times. See, it's in the hard times that God looks and sees what you do. See, in the times when you're going through and those bills need to be paid. In the times when you're facing sickness, where you stand upon his word, where you believe him. See, this is something that God is speaking. And see, you have to understand that, see, this is something that Joseph did. Now watch this. He sold into slavery. Then he gets sold again to a, a man by the name of Potiphar. All right? But in this situation, he's still a slave. But God still has favor on him that he comes up to be the administrator of the estate. All right? Joseph was a hard worker. He was a handsome young man, because the Bible says that about him. All right? God was with him, and God made him prosper and be successful. See, but then there comes this temptation from part of his wife. Check it out now. She's looking at this boy every day. You know, he yoked up, cut young, man out of town. You know, he coming through the house. Mm -hmm. So one day she cornered him. See, temptation will try to corner you. Understand, temptation first wants to entice you. Entice you. How does it entice you? Wherever your weakness is, temptation will come that way. 
It's not going to come. See, see, see. The devil's not going to come offer you a glass of Drano. And you know it's Drano. You I ain't drinking that. But he will come and offer you a double scotch. And you know that you have been delivered from alcoholism. All right? See, it doesn't say anywhere, let me clear that up. It doesn't say anywhere that anyone that drinks goes to hell. What the Bible talks about is those that have red eyes. Woe to those that have red eyes. Those, those get drunk. But it tells you that that type of drinking will cause you to have an alter behavior than what God wants. That's why when you're looking at some of these commercials and they say, they talk about the liquor and then they say the spirits. <laughs> They're absolutely right. The spirits is in them. You see what I'm saying? So this is just something that you don't do. Yes. You know, you just choose not to do that. All right? So don't get, don't, 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 don't misunderstand and say the pastor said drinking is going to send me to hell. No, I'm not going to say that. Because I can't find a scripture that does say that. And if anyone does, you show it to me. To this point, I haven't. Mm -hmm. But what I can say is that majority of the people that do that, they do it to an extreme and to an abuse. Yeah. See, this is where God is talking about don't be a stumbling block to your brother. What does that mean? Right. You want to drink a glass of wine. There's nothing wrong with you drinking a glass of wine. But now you know that that brother that you finna sit down to dinner with, you understand me, had 15 years of alcoholic problems. Right. And you're going to sit there, you understand me, in front of him. You should have enough respect for him to, to wait, get you eliminated or something, and don't do that. Why? It's because now he orders a drink, and he has a flashback. Maybe he's not as strong as you, okay? Now, the next time you hear about him, he's had a flashback. Mm -hmm. You see, this is what happens to a lot of people, you know, when they get delivered from cocaine. First thing they want to do is go back over in the neighborhood and witness. Right. right. Don't you think the devil going to witness to you, too? Okay. Okay. Yeah, Joe, you've been good, boy. You've been good about six months. You don't mind taking a tote here and a tote there. You understand me? No, the devil is not going to bring an ugly man into your life. He's going to bring a man into your life that you really cared about from before. Okay. okay. Or one that you don't know that has some of those characteristics. Hello? And then you get goo eyed and what have you. Mm. See, the same with men. Mm. You have to understand that temptation, Hello? you know, it first comes with an enticement. Mm -hmm. It first comes with an enticement, and this is what happened with Joseph. You know, I, I, and you can imagine, this woman was, was, was married to a rich man. She probably was very attractive, mm -hmm. probably had all the right things to wear, mm -hmm. and he growing up in there every day, but it came to a point that the temptation, he had to run from it. Absolutely. He had to separate himself from it. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, you can't keep knocking at the door of temptation. Mm -hmm. You have to separate yourself from it. Mm -hmm. You might have to change your number. Mm -hmm. You might have to get a restraining order. Mm -hmm. You might have to do whatever is necessary to keep yourself safe. Mm -hmm. Amen. He said, no one, see this is after she jams him up. Joseph said, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. He says, my master hasn't withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Mm -hmm. Then could I do this wicked sin against God? He didn't even mention the dude. You know, he said, can I do this sin against God? Now look, stop and think about it, people. This thing couldn't probably happen without anybody knowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But see, it's not whether you're in public or you're in private. Thank you. It's how you act in both places. Your behavior is consistent. You see what I'm saying? This is what we're learning from Joseph. You see, Joseph's temptation, it was a long period. It was. We don't know how long this woman did this, okay? He tried to resist him. Like I said, he came to a point where he had to just leave. And then because of him leaving, she lied on him. False accusation. Man ain't did nothing. How many times? Don't raise your hand. People done lied on you. But just no reason. You like, man, where you get that from? You know, they're the, they're the folks that you want to say, man, you need some medication. You understand? I mean, first let's start with some medication, then we'll follow up with prayer. But get you some medication first. <laughs> See? For no reason. False accusations. But you notice one thing about Joseph through his whole life? You never heard him say to anyone that that was a lie. He didn't, he just dealt with it. 
You never heard him say anything negative about his brothers that put him into slavery. You never heard him say anything while he was in the prison about the woman that caused this. Never. Not one word as you read about Joseph's life. Not one word. Not one word. See, kind of different than with him than it was the children over there in Israel. They murmured about everything. Man, I ain't got no water. I ain't got nothing to eat. Man, I, you know. See, we can get sometimes like that where we're, we're murmuring and complaining without even thinking about it. Murmuring and complaining without even thinking about it, not appreciating what God has given you. This child's so bad. I'm always acting bad, but see, you're not considering that that child is a blessing. Man, I'm so tired of this job and these folks, but you're not considering that God bless you to put you in that position, that you're able to have a gainful means of support. See, see, we can, we can easily flip the script, but I want you to learn something from the life of Joseph. He didn't flip the script. He stayed true. He stayed true to God. He kept his mouth shut. And he dealt with whatever it was. And because of that, every place that he was in, God raised this boy up. Hmm. Now, come on now. You in prison. And the warden make you in charge of everything? You in prison. You was considered a criminal. Hmm. And he makes you an administrator? He makes you to watch over the other inmates? See, that's favor from God. I want you to understand the purpose of temptation. One, it is to undermine God's will in your life. Because if he can get you, then he can stop the will of God in your life. I say it again. One, is to undermine the will of God in your life. Two, to stray you from God's way. To pull you away from God. See, that's what enticement does. See, check a prostitution, all right? Street worker, whatever you want to call her, you know. She on the corner making all her goods available. Why? It's because it is for enticement. A man riding down the street, he had, you know, he's enticed. He's enticed so he turns, okay? See, that's enticement. Enticement even comes in the way of sales. Think about it. You in the store finna buy something totally different. And they come over to speak, we got a sale on TVs. 50 inch TVs. They were $999. Today they are $899. You don't even have 599 but you finna run over and put it on that card. See, that was an enticement to pull you away from the will of God. And then you say, I saved. You ain't saved nothing because if you had, you wasn't intended on spending it. It's different if you went into the store to buy a 50 inch TV. Okay? And you caught it on sale, that's a blessing of God. Okay? Or if you had intents on buying it and you had the money, notice what I said, had the money and it wasn't going to hurt you, and you heard the sale and you bought it. But if you didn't have the money and you're just going to try to save $200, now you got to figure out how to get the whole money to pay them bills. See, 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 that's enticement also. See, understand, that's what temptation comes with. People, if we're going to be sharp in the things of God, we got to recognize what enticement is. Enticement, you understand me, for those that have been delivered from drugs, you understand me, enticement is, you, you, you walking down the street, and the guy in front of you, he drop a bag of rocks out of his pocket and don't know. Whoa, Lord, that must be from God. You was a lie. You was a lie. See, you have to start knowing that when these things come, that you can't bite. Another thing of the purpose of temptation is, temptation is at its core. It is to deny, and I'll say this slowly, to deny the authority of God in your life and to seek your own independence from God. You're denying the authority of God in your life when you when you buy into temptation because you're saying that the will of God is not enough for you. My will is more important. You see what I'm saying? So you have to understand this. 
1 Corinthians 13, 10 and 13, I'll, I'll read it from the Amplified. You can write it down. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, For no temptation, no trial regarded as enticing to sin, no matter how it comes or where it leads, has overtaken you and lay hold on you that is not common to man. That is, no temptation or trial has come to you that is beyond human resistance. I'll say that again. No temptation, no trial or testing that comes to you is beyond human resistance. And that is not adjusted. And that trial that's not above human resistance, that is not adjusted and adapted and belonging to human experience. And such as man can bear, as notice, as you can bear, all right? He can trust, all right? Let me go back up here. But God is faithful to his word and to his compassionate nature. And he can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried beyond your ability and strength. He is faithful not to let you be tested above your ability and strength of resistance and power to endure. But with the temptation, he also provides the way out. Now, this is what I like about this. With the temptation, he provides the way out, all right? The means of escape to a landing place. I like the way they said that in the Amplified, to a landing place, that you may be able and strong and powerful to bear up under it patiently. Again, I read to you Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Not all things, people, that happen in your life is intended for good. Not all things that come into your life is sent by God, okay? Not all things in your life will be comfortable. Not all things that happen in your life will you understand. You don't understand everything. You don't understand. There's friends of mine that, that, that have gone home to be with the Lord, and I didn't understand. I really didn't. I didn't understand. And I was like, Lord, you know, these were men that I know that were honorable men. These were men of prayer, men of the word, and they went home like this? Just, 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 I didn't understand. But God didn't try to explain it to me. I still don't understand. I guess he'll tell me when I get there. But my faith has to be that God was not caught off guard with this happening. That God, even in the midst of that, has a plan for this individual's wife, for his children, and those plans are good. See, I like, I like the way God instructed Joshua in Joshua 1.9 where he says, have I, have I not commanded you? No, he didn't ask. He didn't, he didn't say this is a recommendation. He didn't say you possibly could do this, Joshua. He said, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, mm -hmm. nor be dismayed. Yes, right. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. No, he said, he was straight with him. He said, look, man, I'm commanding you. Be strong. Right. Be strong and of good courage. Because he knew that Joshua was going to face some enemies that he wasn't used to. He was going to go through some things with people that he wasn't used to. He knew this. He knew that in leadership and in coming into a point, you're going to deal with certain situations that you have never dealt with before. But he said, be strong. He didn't ask him. Be strong in the midst of that. Be strong and have a good courage. That was a command. And the same command that was for Joshua is the same command that's for us. Yes, don't you, don't you think that God knows what you're going through? He knows how you're hurting. He knows your pain. But yet and still, he says, be strong. Why? Because he wants to use you in your life. He has plans for you, just like he does, just like he does with uh, Joseph. You see this in the life of Joseph. Look, 17 years old, this little happy boy. Oh, Lord, I had a dream. Right. Sound like a Martin Luther King thing, huh? He said, I had a dream. Tell his brother he's not doing that. He's naive. He said he's doing a good thing. But because of that, his brothers hate him. 
The dream was a good thing. Your vision is a good thing. The plans of God in your life are a good thing. But that doesn't mean that everybody you tell those things to are going to be excited with you. You might as well get ready for it. Yeah, you want Aunt Mabel to like it, like what God is doing in your life. But Aunt Mabel, well, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, you want everybody to be excited. You have to know that God is giving you that dream. He's giving you that vision. But this young boy never gave up on the dream. He never gave up on the vision. Why? Because the dream and the vision and the God he served was better and bigger than the trouble that he faced. Yes, it was. Didn't matter that he was lied on. Didn't matter that he was sold into slavery. Didn't matter. What mattered was, God, you gave me a dream at 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And you're faithful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter when a woman lied on him and accused him falsely. Didn't matter. It didn't matter when he helped the man out of prison because he was able to interpret a dream and the man forgot about him and left him in there for two more years. It didn't matter. What mattered was the dream and the vision and the God that he served. That's what should matter to you. Yes, God knows you hurt. The person disappointed you. The person let you down. The person lied to you. The person betrayed you. He understands that. But the vision and the dream should be bigger than the betrayal, than the divorce, than the lost job, than the lack of money. It should be bigger than that. We can't just say our God is a big God. We have to know he's a big God. God reminds us that we're not to lose heart. You see, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various or diverse temptations, trials, and testings, knowing that the testing of your faith, the testing of your faith. See, there's another scripture that says, over there, I believe it's 1 Peter, it says, your, your, your faith is like precious gold. But in order, it says here, the testing of your faith. I told you last week that any gold, any, any metal that has to be purified, it has to go through a fire. And in that fire, what happens is the real gold goes to the bottom, and everything that's contrary to the metal floats to the top. Why? Because it was never meant to be a part of that metal. You understand what I'm saying? It was never meant to be that. So this is something that you know that you're going to go through the fire. You're going to go through that, OK? He says, the testing of your faith, talking about James, the testing produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect. That word perfect means ma mature. Mature. Look at your name and say, are you mature? Mature. And complete. Don't answer it, neighbor. Don't answer it. Don't answer it. If they, if they, if they didn't smile at you, just act like they did. <laughs> but let patience have this perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, Hebrews 10, 35 to 36 says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you need, for you, you have need of endurance. Understand, endurance. Endurance is the ability to bear up under pressure. That's what exactly what it means. You know how many of you watch the more Western movies or movies where they putting they putting sacks and stuff on a mule's back. Mule is standing there, but he going down a little bit. He going down, and he's like, "Wow, look at all that stuff they putting on that mule's back." He's going down. He's going down. But see, the thing of it is, is that this mule has learned to endure under pressure. You have to be able to endure under pressure. Hurt, betrayal, disappointment, all of this is pressure. You must learn to endure up under that pressure. This is what the word of God is for. It is to build us, to strengthen us, to guide us, to direct us, to lead us. This is why Jesus showed us that we must live by the word, not just be people that talk about the word. We must be able to exemplify Jesus in our life, in our words, in our thoughts. Why? Because everything on us, our mind, our body, our spirit, our future, everything is under attack by the enemy. Don't take it and don't be naive. We serve a God that has an enemy. We serve a God that has protected us. Why does he need to protect us unless we have an enemy? That old saying, people go around like, like ostrich with the head stuck in the sand. 
The Bible also says, do not think it's strange when you go through fiery trial. You know, people run around and tell me, I don't understand why I'm going through this. Are you saying? Yes. Well, you don't even answer. They may be slow, but sooner or later they're going to catch it. Are you saying? Uh-huh. Okay. Might take them a while, but they're going to catch on. For being saved means that you're going to go through stuff. The devil has no need to attack his own. Hello? You don't need to attack his own. Uh, For what? Right. They already headed to hell. That's right. He ain't got to do nothing to them. No, don't. Mm. If they keep living the way they're living, they're going to end up there. So all he needs to do is supply them with enough stuff to keep them focused on that jump. Amen. It's you that he needs to be concerned with. Why? It's because if he can get you off track, notice this, people. If you get caught up in yourself, if you get caught up in yourself, what happens is this. You're not able to minister to someone else. Because you're thinking about you. Me, 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 me. My problems, my problems, my issues, what I'm going through. This is what happens, okay? I just a few more minutes, and like I said, I'm wrapping this up. Then we have number three was Joseph in prison, all right? That's when he, you know, he was lied on. He went to prison, okay? And, you know, come on now. The boy had been through all kinds of stuff. He had sold his savior. Now he sold to a part of it. Now he in prison for something he ain't did. Don't you think that he probably had moments like we have? Maybe I miss God. Maybe I had too much pizza that night, and that was what caused that dream, you know? But he wouldn't entertain those thoughts. See, this is where the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, it says, pulling down strongholds, anything that will exalt itself over the knowledge of Christ. See, he had knowledge that God had given him. And anything contrary to that, he had to be man enough, you understand me, to pull that stronghold down, to grab that stronghold. Why? It's because it was trying to exalt itself over the knowledge of Christ. You have to understand that every promise that God has given you is the knowledge of Christ. Mm -hmm. And you have to also understand that you need to be able to pull that thought that will try to exalt itself over that. What are you saying, Pastor? What are you saying? All right, then. Poverty, for you to accept poverty and lack, is saying that God is not able to do what he said in Philippians according to all his need. If you know that you have sown into the life of men and women of the gospel, if you have done this, it, it, you have sown your seed, it says that you know what, because of that act, God will, according to that word, see that every need, not just needs, every need, all right, is met according to his riches in Christ Jesus. God has also made promises. See, over there, when I talked about uh, Joseph saying that my master has made you know, me head of everything, and he's, he's withheld nothing back. Well, see, there's a scripture over in Psalms 84 and 11 that sounds so familiar to that. It says, God will withhold no good thing right. from them that walk up righteously. Right. Woo! Right. You're seeing that in Joseph's life. He said he will withhold no good thing from them that walk up rightly. And somebody probably said, well, Pastor, you don't know. You don't know my life. You don't know what I've been going through. You don't know. Hey, if you in Jesus, you are walking up rightly. Right. You, can't, you can't work to get righteousness. No. Righteousness was given to you because of God's grace. Amen. And yes, you may have some areas in your life that are weak. You may have some places in your life that are weak. Mm -hmm. But you must know that it's through staying in the word that you grow and you mature. Mm -hmm. You don't grow and you mature, you understand me, outside of the word, outside of the fellowship. That's why the Bible says, iron sharp as iron. So many people have created their own ways of trying to develop themselves in Christianity. That is hogwash. That is foolishness. And it hurts God's heart. Why? It's because God has put a method and a plan to develop you, to grow you know what I'm saying? To grow you. He wants you to grow. He wants you to prosper in every area. He wants you to be strong and of good courage. But you can't be that way when you're around negative people. When you're around people, you understand me, that are doing things contrary to the word. You cannot do that. You cannot just come to church for two hours on a Sunday and think you got enough to get you all the way to next Sunday. You got enough sense to even know in your car. If you put $10 worth of gas in there, you can't drive $15 worth. Hello. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you got to say something. I ain't talking about when you cut off and you coach the rest of the five hours. <laughs> Praise God. See, going through that 
Joseph didn't know. That's what I want you to get understand. He didn't know what tomorrow looked like. He was in prison. But see, the scripture that should encourage us is Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. For where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than the ways, than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. What he's saying is, he's saying that, you know what? Because you don't see it in the moment, because you don't see it in the moment, does not mean it's not in the future. Amen. I'll say that again. Because you see only fire right now, because you only see pain and hurt right now, that does not mean it's going to be in your future. You have to trust God. See, there are some, there are some times that, that things right, will happen in a certain way, and we don't know why they happen. We don't have a clue. There'll be things that'll cut us and hurt us so deep that only God and you know how deep it hurts. But he still says, my ways are higher than your ways. You see, God thinks about the future. And a great deal of the time, we as people, we only think about the moment. Only the moment. Okay, only the moment. Think about a friend of mine, I'll use this, you know, he was in a hurry. He was in a hurry, he's, he, he's an electrical contractor, he was in a hurry. He knew certain, you know, certain rules and regulations that we have for when we do things, but he was in a hurry. He owned his own company, all right? He couldn't wait for the secondary guy to come. And because of his impatientness, because he didn't want to wait, he went down, he was, you know, uh, doing the job for the uh, Los Angeles Sheriff Department downtown. So he went, he, he, he snatched off, bam, he snatched off the panel covers. And when he snatched off the panel covers, one of the, one of the main wires came out and exploded and set him on fire. All the lights in the building went off, bam, because, you know, this is the Sheriff Department, and the emergency kicked right in. So when they went down to see what was happening, he's laying on the floor on fire, on fire, on fire. And you probably say, oh, that's a horrible story. Mm -hmm. This man was burnt 60% of his body. He yes, he did. Okay. Yes, he did. He's assistant pastor of a well-known church, and you couldn't even tell, you know, unless you knew he went through this, unless you got real close up on him and looked. But see, he kept his joy. He kept his faith in God. I remember calling him. Um, I was doing a job, and I needed some information because I called him the, the electrical guru, and I needed some information. And I called him, his wife answered the phone and I said, I need to ask him a question and I never forget what she said. You know that fool blew himself up. <laughs> you still want some information? See, they were still able in the midst of all of that. But see, understand this, that there was a period of time that for like close to a year and a half, two years, he could be around no dirt because the skin was very sensitive and it would. He could be around no dirt. See, there's a separation time that God doesn't want you around any dirt. Yes, you might have some scars, you understand me, from what you've been through. But if you let the healing process take place, people won't even know you've been through it. They won't even know you've been through it. They won't even know you've been through it. You know, and see, this is where you have to know, you understand me, to let God work in your life. Just a couple more minutes, please. Mm. You see, Galatians 6 and 9 says, and let, let us not grow weary while doing good. Joseph never became weary. He kept doing good in spite of, in spite of all the bad that was coming to him, he kept giving out good. You know, when he was in prison and they, had to, they, they needed some interpretation for that dream, he could have sat over the corner and said, mm -hmm. I'm gonna let him kill you. <laughs> ain't nobody help me. I ain't finna help you. Mm -hmm. He could have sat right there. But no, he didn't. He voluntarily gave his services. So you have to understand that even in the midst of your pain, you're still obligated to help. Yes, you you're still obligated to love. Yes, you, you see, we have taken that, we have taken that Romans uh, 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 13 and 8 and twisted it where it says, Owe no man nothing 
but to love him. We want to put that to finances. Oh, oh no man, nothing. I want to be debt free. But you know really that, that scripture is telling you the only debt that you have, the only debt that you're obligated to, the only debt that God will not remove is that you love the person sitting next to you, your brother and sister. That's the debt that you will have. You're internally indebted to one another. Joseph understood this. Again, I say to you, Romans 8, 28, oh, we know that all things work to good for them, for them, for them, for them that love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. See, we're talking, see, that scripture right there is talking about people that love God. Amen. See, love God. Mm -hmm. Ain't talking about people that you understand we have no love for God. You see, 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 love is always action. Yes, when you love God, God can see your actions. Mm -hmm. See, it's just not in your conversation. It's in your action. Mm -hmm. The last one I want to touch on is, like I said, it was five phases, is the reunion. When Joseph meets his family, here they come. You know, here come them cats that sold me. If them cats hadn't sold me, all this stuff I went through, <coughs> I wouldn't be facing but this man had a forgiving heart. There are going to be times that you're going to run face to face and people uh, face to face with people that have hurt you, people that have damaged you, people that have cut you, people that have betrayed you. But you are to still operate in forgiveness and love. So, oh, Pastor, that's hard. That's why I said earlier, it takes faith to walk in love. You're going to come to that, but you got to still love them regardless, because. It will hinder your blessings. You don't want your blessings hindered. Shoot, man, I'm finna love you to, oh, I'm, I'm finna say to death, but I'm, I'm gonna love you to life. You understand me? I'm finna love you. Why? Because I know God got something better for me. See, because remember over there, I believe it's in uh, uh, Genesis 39 and 50, where, 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 where uh, Joseph said, hmm, what you intended for me for harm, whoo. <laughs> God intended for good. Look at me now. <laughs> Look at me now. <laughs> you, know, can you, can you know, come on, you know how you like to do it. Look at me now. I, <laughs> I remember when I was on the bus stop, but look at me now. I remember when I didn't have no house, but look at me now. Oh, yeah. But you intended for evil. Oh, God. Turn it for good. Amen. Amen. May the Lord continue to bless you. May the Lord look upon your house and your children and continue to keep his hands and his protection around you. Father God, as we have come today, Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for such a wonderful time in you, for such a, for such a rich word. Father, I thank you that as this word has went forth, Lord God, that it has penetrated each and every one of our hearts. And Father, the lesson that we have received from the life of Joseph, Lord God, we will be careful not to complain, careful not to murmur, Lord God. We will be careful, Lord God, to walk in love in the midst of any situation, Lord God, knowing, Lord God, that you, Father, will turn it to our good because of your purposes and intents for our life. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that we are a people, Lord God, that have open eyes, people that move in the spirit of discernment, people that will move in love, Lord God, regardless of circumstances, regardless of trials. We will move in love. Love, Lord God, that you have poured in our hearts. Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. And let the church say, Amen. 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 Let the church say it again. Say, Amen. 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 See, y'all sound just like you did earlier. Say it again. Say, Amen. Amen. Amen.